Hey everybody, it's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Hopefully I'm showing up uh, on your screen up here. Uh, next to me on my, I guess my right, technically, right, is Craig Dwyer. Uh, Craig is the founder of Fortitude. Hey, Hey, everybody. Uh, for a change, a remarkable platform that works with nonprofits, activists, and campaigns on digital strategy. And he's here with us today for the next hour or so to talk about some really remarkable and extraordinary work that he's done. Uh, this gentleman over here helped to bring marriage equality to Ireland and Australia. Uh, and he did so. He was the social media manager for uh, social media director, excuse me, for Ireland's successful Yes Equality campaign. Uh, that took place. And then in 2017, he traveled to Australia and helped move marriage in that country. Um, so Craig's going to share a little bit about what worked, why they built digital strategies, why they were so effective, but particularly with a focus on why research and data are so crucial to a successful strategy. He's going to walk us through the, the pillars of any successful digital campaign and why defining success at the beginning matters so, so much. Uh, understanding where you're headed is, is critical to getting there. Um, a couple quick logistical items. If this looks different to you all, it's because it is. We're using a new platform. I wrote you a little note down there in the chat box. Um, we're on something called Zoom. Uh, we're learning as we go. Craig has been very kind to agree to be our first uh, guinea pig, if you will. You probably also noticed my name is not Tristan Mahabir. He's <laughs> right here. And we're still figuring this all out as we go, but we're really excited to hear from Craig. A um, couple things about Zoom. So you're, hopefully you're familiar with it, but if you're not, if you look down there, you'll see something that says Q&A. So you can type your questions in there. And we think, Tristan, I think this is right. We think that you can vote for the questions, right? Should be able to. We'll see how it uh, works. <laughs> uh, so Peter's already written a, a question. Hey, Peter. Uh, so you can type questions there. And then there's a chat box over to the right corner if, if I'm representing on your screen the way I think I am. Uh, and you should see chats. So you can talk to one another. Let us know who you are, where you're from, uh, and we'll start talking all of one another. I see Gene in there. Uh, let's see if it goes up. Anyway, so you'll see if we look like we're a little perplexed just because, yeah, we are. We're driving this car for the first time. It's like being in a rental car. We know how to drive, but we're not quite sure where the gears are on this one uh, or where the radio is. Anyway, uh, bear with us as we learn, uh, and you are in for a real treat. We had a chance to get acquainted and, and chit chat a little bit with Craig just the other day, and uh, it won't surprise you. He has a delightful Irish accent, and he is a remarkable, extraordinary man. I mean, he has changed the world uh, and made it better. So we are incredibly grateful for his time and his willingness to share what he's learned with all of us. So why don't we go ahead and get this started? Uh, just another matter, of course, you all always ask this. Yes, we're recording this. It'll pop up on our YouTube channel and on comnetwork.org probably in the next couple of days. And our good friend, Yabby Ferris, uh, is live tweeting the proceedings here. So you can also follow along on Twitter. The hashtag for that is comnetlive. It's hashtag C-O-M-N-E-T-L-I-V-E. So you can see basically Yabby's going to be making some live notes as we go. All right, I've yacked enough. Craig, you want to take us away, sir? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I feel from that intro, I already have, have a lot to, to live up to. Um, but I just want to, to start off by thanking Sean and Tristan and the Communications Network for inviting me to, to do this webinar and to all of the attendees for, for joining in and learning a little bit more. Um, yeah, so as Sean mentioned, uh, my name is Craig Dwyer. Uh, I'm the founder of For Change. I work with campaigning groups, activists, nonprofit organizations on designing and implementing effective digital strategies for progressive social change. I suppose that's the, the overarching topic of today's um, webinar. Um, so without further ado, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of, of my, my background. So there I am there as, as Shaw mentioned. So I, yes, I was the social media director for Yes Equality during the, the marriage equality referendum here in Ireland in 2015. And um, so that was, it was really the first time that social media was used in kind of like new and innovative ways and, um, you know, for communications, mobilizing, organizing, creating a network of supporters right across the country. And we will, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in due course. So then um, after the, the referendum, I received this fellowship from an organization called the Social Change Initiative um, to build this online resource for campaigners and, and nonprofit organizations on how to use and get the most out of digital and social media. So the product of that is, is for a change. Um, 
Yeah, and then in 2017, I was lucky enough to be invited to go over and spend a month on the equality campaign in Australia. So that was their campaign for, for marriage equality. Again, successful. So that was in November 2017. And we'll also talk a little bit more about that later. And then um, most recently, so in 2018, I co-founded the Transparent Referendum Initiative. So this was a volunteer-led civic initiative that focused on how social media advertising is used during political campaigns. And we very much were advocating for the increased transparency um, of, of political advertising. Um, on social media. So that's just a little bit about my background and that, that like th those themes you'll see coming through a lot more um, throughout the discussion. So what I'd like to focus on for the first part of this webinar is the changing nature um, of change making and the impact that that is having. Um, and then after the first section, then we'll take a break for a bit of a QA. and a um, And then after that, in the latter half, We'll talk more about those campaigns um, for marriage equality, both in, in, in Ireland and Australia, and then we'll finish up with, with another Q&A then at the end. So just to kick things off, so as you know, like the, the internet, digital and social media, it's fundamentally changed how we go about our lives and our, our business, you know, and you, you will have come across this term, digital transformation, you know, which is often I think most associated with the corporate world, but I think it's fair to say that the campaigning sector is undergoing its own digital transformation, um, but often with much less, less resources. You know, and, and the, the rapidly changing and evolving technological and social environments, it means that like, you know, as campaigners, I think we need to be nimble in our response, you know, as, current digital platforms evolve and change and new technology emerges, you know, that, that often presents new challenges. But I think we need to be able to, to rise up and adapt and embrace these opportunities. Because at the end of the day, I think that these platforms do allow us to become better communicators and better campaigners. Um, I've just given a couple of examples there of, of campaigns that really utilize these platforms in, in new and innovative ways. So Yes Equality, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a bit, um, you know, Invisible in the US, so this grassroots movement that really grew from like, started off with a Google Doc. Black Lives Matter, I think, you know, really good example of like, translating this online support into real offline action to shine a light on the struggle for racial justice in the US. Um, and also, so together for yes, this was like the successful civil society campaign during the abortion referendum here in Ireland in 2018. So I think like, you know, you could, you could almost call these campaigns like um, digital disruptors um, as such, you know, and I think there's a lot that, that, that we can learn um, from these. But I think what they all have in common is that they were able to, to adapt and evolve and really utilize these platforms um, in the most effective ways. Now, but so I think if we'll just take a bit of a closer look at the evolution um, of tech and campaigning over the years. So if we think back to 2008 and the Obama campaign, I think this was the, 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 this, the Obama campaign in 2008 is often credited with being the first campaign to really um, use Web 2.0 in, in, in an effective way, although some would argue that it was actually the Howard Dean team in 2002 and that their, their, their ambition to create a Netroots campaign and their use of um, Meetup to, for their organizing efforts. But in 2008, I think, you know, the Obama campaign was really effective in, in utilizing um, web and emails, um, but it was primarily for recruitment, mobilizing and organizing. And then over you know, the next few years, um, th th these platforms, again, they evolved. And by the time 2012 came around, social media was like the new player in the game. And these were providing new ways of, of engaging um, voters. But I think the, the, the focus was still on that, that recruitment and that mobilization. Um, again, you know, you look forward to another few years then, 
it, again, I think it has shifted. You know, we had a lot of the, the, the virality of content on social media and like the, the ways to reach new audiences in organic ways was really, really powerful. And just thinking about, yes, equality in particular, you know, um, after the campaign, it was really being held up there and lauded as being this really powerful tool for facilitating the democratic process, you know, and I think those, 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 those um, viral efforts, it was really helping to move beyond kind of just that mobilization piece of the campaign recruitment. And also you're moving into being able to persuade new voters and reach outside of, of your base. And um, also in 2015, so like, in the UK, they, they had a general election in 2015. And that was the first time that, that we really saw social media advertising being used, you know, and, and the Conservative Party there in the UK, they used Facebook targeting to great effect in kind of some really key um, constituencies to swing the vote. Um, and that's often, you know, um, referred to a lot in terms of the, the, the shifting trends and moving towards these data-driven campaigns. Um, but often people forget about like the Labour Party in the UK, that their efforts in 2015 as well, you know, and they really tapped into this grassroots organic campaign and um, you know there was this lots of means and, and ways to to engage younger audiences and um, so we were definitely seeing kind of um, both efforts during that time and um, but again you know what I'm trying to, to get across here is that in, in short spaces of time and um, these platforms are constantly evolving constantly changing and and, and, and it's it's those campaigns I think that are, that, that, that respond and, and evolve and adapt to the, these changes they're the ones that are able to kind of I suppose reap the, the rewards and I suppose that that was kind of an issue then that came to the fore with the likes of the, the, the Trump and the brexit campaigns very much moving into to data driven campaigns here and the whole issue that comes with data harvesting and profiling um, and really getting down to, to granular targeting with dark ads on social media um, through the, in, in those campaigns specifically. And I think with previously efforts in, in, during these campaigns would have been focused on campaign recruitment and mobilization. I think in, 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 in recent years that has tipped now, you know, and it's more focused on the persuasion and reaching out to people outside your base and trying to influence how they're going to vote. And that's kind of really where the, where the social media advertising has come to the fore. Um, but it still is used for, for, for mobilization efforts as well. Um, but I think no matter what, the, what changes this ever, ever, ever changing kind of landscape brings, I think it's important as campaigners that we remind ourselves of like that some of the basic principles um, required for can, when we're campaigning for, for progressive social change. Um, I know that like many of you on this webinar today, you know, you as con strategic communications professionals, you'll be more than familiar with many of these concepts, um, you know, as part of your overall campaign strategies. But there are a couple that I just wanted to, to draw your attention to, just with regards utilizing uh, digital platforms as part of, of your strategy. Um, so, you know, obviously you're going to have your aims and your objectives, and I think it's really important to make sure that you, you have specific aims and objectives for your, for your digital campaign as well. Then when we're thinking about our target audiences, having that detail in terms of who it is that, we're, that, you're, that you're trying to reach, um, because that's then going to help inform, you know, what platforms should you be most active on? You know, are we primarily trying to target younger audiences? Well, if so, you know, then we need to be active on Instagram. Is, is it more trying to influence the, the, the media and the politicians and, and that agenda? If that's the case, you know, we'll, we'll, we're going to, to be able to, to meet those objectives um, on Twitter. Or, you know, so it's about knowing what, the, what those aims and objectives are, who your target audience is, and then that is definitely going to feed into to what platforms you should be on and where you should be allocating those resources. And then that's also going to help, like what type of content do we need to engage these audiences? 
So, you know, you're going to have to, you need to have like really relevant, informative, shareable content, stuff that people are going to want to, to, to get behind. Thinking of things, so if it's, if it's younger audiences, they're primarily consuming content now in really short form. So like Instagram stories, having um, real short, engaging videos. Um, so it's, it's the ability to be able to keep up to date with all of these emerging trends and knowing, okay, this is our audience. This is how they're consuming content. So in order to meet this aim, we need to, to be doing that on this platform in order to engage these people. Um, and then it's about how do you actually, so you're, you're engaging your audiences, but how do you then take them offline or inspire them to take action? So being really explicit in what, what, the, what, what the ask is, you know, and providing a, a many different ways that audiences can really get involved with your campaign. So having that kind of spectrum of participation. And um, so, you know, people might want to get really involved and they'll make a video on your behalf where they're telling their story about, you know, what motivates them. Um, but then somebody might just want to sign up to, to your mailing list and be kept updated with what's going on. You know, so having those different ways that people can get involved, I think is, is really important in converting that online support um, into to offline action. Um, and then also, I think one of the really big benefits of digital and social media is the ability to, to measure um, everything that we're doing, you know, it, uh, moving towards those, those uh, data-driven campaigns as such, you know. So, for example, if you're taking out like an ad in, in, in your local media or national media, you don't really know how many people are going to see that ad. But when it comes to, to online platforms, you, know, you do have that level of information where you can see exactly how many people you've reached, the demographics, you know, and you can, you can respond and adapt based on that information that you're getting back. So it's constantly being able to, to monitor, test, what's working, what's not, what do we need to tweak, what messages are resonating more with these audiences um, and, and, and moving in that direction. And I think that's the, one, of the, one of the really big benefits of, of, of using these platforms to your, to your advantage. You know, and often um, as campaigners, you know, it, it, it often, it, it's, sorry, losing my train of thought here, but ca campaigning can often be portrayed as, as a fight, as a battle or as a crusade. And nowhere does this manifest itself better than on the internet and through social media. But I think that in order to affect real change, campaigns must be able to move beyond the struggle of those who are um, of those involved and to reach people who are not directly affected. People for whom the campaign doesn't represent a fight, but rather something that they can feel compelled to be a part of, you know, because I think essentially people are motivated to do good. It's just the task of campaigns to be able to, to mobilize these people and facilitate their action. And I think that this, this requires moving beyond those combative concepts to more collaboration, listening, and really empowering supporters and, and facilitating their action. You know, often one of the biggest criticisms of digital and social media for campaigning is this perceived slacktivism, you know, that doesn't actually amount to any real change. I think progressive digital campaigns are ones that are able to move supporters to deeper engagement by inspiring them to take action, be it providing opportunities for collaboration where they can create their content and tell the, their, their own stories or you know, taking, taking offline action. So really using it for those, those mobilization efforts, getting them out, um, attending rallies, protests, whatever that action might be. So it's engaging them with your compelling um, frame in, in, uh, letting them know what action they need to take in order to, to contribute to the campaign in the most effective way, outlining that, that ask and providing the ways that they can do that. Um, I think with that, 
was going to move on to the first section of the Q&A before we move on to a more practical application of these, these strategies. So do we have any questions at the moment? We do. Uh, Carla asks us, uh, so Craig, what do you mean by the word organic when we're talking about organic reach or organic social media? Yes, so organic reach is, is when um, no spend is put behind any of your, your, of your posts or your content on social media. So when, if we think back to say like 2012, um, you know, 2013 organic reach was um, one of the, the, the biggest ways of reaching new audiences. You know, you didn't, the, you didn't need to um, rely on paid advertising in order to, to reach audiences. Your content was organically spreading amongst people's networks because uh, people were, you know, it was kind of like that, that viral content. So people are commenting, sharing, liking um, content on social media feeds. And therefore, speaking Facebook in particular here now. Um, so when people engage with your posts, so be that like, you know, liking, comment, sharing or clicking on, clicking on it. And um, Facebook's algorithm would then recognize, okay, you know, this, this is an engaging post. We're going to push this up to the top of people's feeds. So therefore, your organic reach um, was much, much wider. So you needed engaging content, and then that results in this kind of like wide organic reach amongst new audiences. So people who don't already like your page and wouldn't normally see your content. So that was ways of, of getting your content further through having engaging content. But increasingly, what we're seeing as these platforms are, adopt, are, are, are constantly evolving and changing is that the algorithm doesn't work in the same way. You know, the, the platforms are moving more towards now, like, you know, pay, like pay for play. That's their, their, their advertising models now is like, you know, they want you to, to spend money in order to be able to reach thousands and thousands of people. So whereas previously, all you needed was to have really engaging content in order to be able to do that, now, unfortunately, it's becoming increasingly difficult to perform really well and reach those audiences organically. And um, you, you need to be putting kind of spend behind your content and, and using more social media advertising to really amplify and boost. We have another question, but I'm going to take the privilege of doing a quick follow up. So, Craig, do you mean that, and I, I'm hoping this made its way across the pond, um, there was something a couple of years back called the Ice Bucket Challenge. This was the Lou Gehrig's, uh, the ALS. Yes, yeah. ALS, ALS Foundation. Um, and it started with people literally pouring buckets of cold ice water on their Yes, that made it across here, yeah. Okay, good. Well, and also I'm sorry because I think it's a little bit chillier over there. But so, but suffice <laughs> to say, is it, are you basically saying it would be hard to see an Ice Bucket Challenge succeed in today's environment given the, the the shift in the way algorithms work and the and the increasing uh reliance on paid social advertising yeah so i'm i'm, I'm definitely not saying that it's not possible but it is m way more difficult you know especially in this kind of environment now where people do look to examples like the als i spoke a challenge and you know it's always that question is like how do we go viral you know, and it's, it's just, it's not as easy anymore um, unless you have something that's really different, really new and innovative um, that's going to kind of break outside your bubble. But I think even at that, it's almost like you need to kind of put pay behind something at the start to give it an initial boost and then hopefully then organically it will spread. But it's that, it's, it's almost like getting it off the ground that's the difficult bit these days. You know, whereas a few years ago, it would have been as simple as having 50 or so people. Um, and, and so in, say within the first 10 minutes of the first ALS Ice Bucket video going up, 50 people are either sharing, commenting, liking, and they're like, okay, so the algorithm is saying, right, okay, this is, this is engaging stuff. We're going to push this up. That doesn't happen in the same way now. So it's given it that initial boost and then hopefully the organic kind of process will take over then. Okay, and speaking of cool stuff, uh, we are seeing, you guys are voting for some of the questions that we're seeing in the box here. So, so right now the top of the pile is our friend Catherine who asks, 
when you talk about creating a digital strategy, do you suggest that that should be created as part of an overall communications plan or a separate, separate and dis something separate and distinct? I can't talk today. Sorry, guys. Uh, it seems to involve components that overall that overlap with an overall communications plan. So I think what she's really asking is, is digital separate and distinct from comms or is it a piece of a larger whole? So the work you did in Ireland, yes. was that in yeah, the, yeah, yeah. a bigger effort? I think, that's, like, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think that's one that's also constantly kind of changing as well. So I think even if we were to kind of do a survey of all of the people on this webinar now, they might have different views on kind of like, where digital should sit. Like, should it sit on its own? Should it report into comms? Should it report into like kind of field organizing? Um, and and I, I don't think there is kind of like a general consensus on, on where it should be. But one thing that I always am saying is that it really sh needs to be core to everything. So I think like in an ideal world, you'd have so in your kind of comms team, you'd have somebody who's really skilled in digital. In your kind of field organizing team, again, you'd have somebody who's really skilled in, in digital. Um, you know, because I do think that it is core to all of your different strands of, 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 of the organization. Um, I'll just, just, like, I'll give you an example. So in 2015, when we were in the planning stages of the campaign here, I almost kind of like had to fight to get social media at the table, you know? Um, it was very, like, it was the very much kind of the team, Like, the structurally, social was, was put off into another state. Yeah. So structurally, social media was kind of, in, this was probably in 2014 when we were in the planning stages. Social would have kind of been be put over to the side. It's like, yeah, 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 that will be grand and that will be lovely to keep that updated throughout. But it's not, it's not going to be as effective as like comms or, you know, all of those other really important strands. And I was like, no, 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 like, you know, this is going to be really important. We need to make sure that it, it, it's treated as such, you know. And... Um, I suppose as the campaign continued, um, the, 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 like the, the, the leaders of the campaign were able to see, okay, yeah, you know, um, this is important. And the, we were able to, to, to showcase that, that to them and bring them on board. Um, and, but then if you, like, so that was in 2015. And again, we were a very small team. Um, overall for the campaign, we were a small team, but like essentially social media was me and two volunteers on a graphic designer. That was like, that was the size of our team. It was quite small. Um, whereas when I went to Australia in 2017, there was a digital department. Now, again, the campaign was on a much larger scale, so it required more resources, but there was, there was like a whole team of digital. Um, but even like at that time, there was questions as to, you know, where the resources were being dragged, like should we be kind of focusing more on the on field or on comms, you know, and there was a there was a story lab, should we be working with them? So I think essentially my 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 long-winded answer to the question is that I believe that it should be core to everything. Yeah, well preach. I, I completely agree. We live in an age where we're all carrying one of these and yeah. literally an inordinate amounts of time on them. Uh, it is the primary way I think most of us, I, I read recently in the US, I don't know if this is true uh, in Ireland and elsewhere, but, but the single biggest source of news for, for most Americans these days is Google, not the New York yeah. Times, or NPR, or the Washington Post, or any number of other outlets, or even some of the online outlets, it's, it's Google. Um, Sharda has a question, eight of you have voted for it, so I'm gonna ask that one next, and then we'll get back into our program. You other, we have some other questions, we'll get to as many as we can, and, cool. and if Greg is kind enough, he's, he's here after hours, as you can imagine. I think we're coming up on eight o'clock in Ireland. Maybe That's we okay. Can go over time a little bit to make sure we get to all these questions, but Sharda asks, do you have strategies for helping groups narrow their target audiences? I find that activists often have big expectations. They want to reach nearly everyone that don't match the resources or capacity they have to offer. And related to that, how do you get groups to be realistic about how much capacity they have to maintain and deepen, they have to, they have, to have to maintain and deepen engagement beyond the one-off touch point? Keeping the channel, uh, channels of communications active and building longer-term relationships with their target audiences. So, so just to distill that down, because that was a mouthful, Charlotte, it's a great question, but just so that Craig can follow this, I think it is, 
you know, do you have strategies to narrow your target audiences, right? And then uh, how much capacity do you need uh, to do that? What kind of resources are we talking about? Yeah, so I think it is, it is really important to be able to, to distill down your, your, your target audience. Like, you know, so yeah, overall, you might be trying to, so I'm just trying to think of an, an example. But like, so for example, like if it's, if it's if it's if it's climate change, you know. So generally, this is like a, like it's a global issue. So therefore, you're you're trying to reach as many people as possible and uh, to inform, educate those, um, you know. But I think it's important to to just to try and distill that down even even further, right? So within that, within the the, the general audience, you might have a cohort of people who are on board. So it's about mobilizing and motivating them to become kind of almost you know your 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 close network of supporters so they can almost like act as ambassadors on your behalf okay so that might be one target audience so they're going to require kind of different messages and different strategies and different ways of engaging them in order to be able to to get them to spread your message um you know and then so you might actually think okay well Younger people are really, you know, they're all, I'm just thinking from on this side of the pond, we had a David Attenborough documentary on Blue Planet and there was like this clip about the, the amount of, yeah, so the amount of plastics in the ocean. And that seems to like, it just, it really captured the imagination of like younger people in particular, you know, so you might think, okay, well, so younger people were exercised around kind of like this kind of idea of the amount of plastics in our ocean. Okay, so let's kind of, focus on creating kind of some content around that and target younger audiences with that content and we'll do that on these platforms. So it's just trying to, to segment it down because if you're if you cast your net too wide and um, it's just it's just not going to it's just not going to work and it's not going to be the most effective way. Um, and then I think it's about also having kind of like different kind of messages and all mes messages and also different messengers to speak to those um, different cohorts and um, within that wider target group as well. You know, but after I do know that that resourcing um, can be an issue as well. Um, so I think what it is, what it's about is, okay, so even, so you might have one piece of content, you might have like, you know, made a piece of, uh, like, a, you know, a piece of video. Um, and that will it'll go up on Facebook and there might be one ask that you think is kind of like for the say older demographics okay so you might just want to bring them more into your fold so the ask of them might be to um, sign up to your mailing list so you'll you'll have one piece of overall content that video will go on to Facebook and the call to action will be to sign up to your mailing list um, so that's that's kind of like that covered. Then you might distill that video down into like a minute for that. That will go on Instagram, and that'll be for the younger audiences. And that might be like you know to actually, I don't know. There might be like um, a rally or an event or something taking place, and you want them to to go and attend that. So whatever the call to action is for that group of people, um, or you might, you might actually then to still it down even further into like an Instagram story and that might be a way of engaging them and bringing them over to your website where they can find out more information about what you're doing. So taking resources into consideration, you've got that one kind of stellar piece of content, but you're repackaging it and reusing it in different ways on different platforms to target those different cohorts within your wider general audience. Great, let's do one more, and then I know you're gonna take us through the case study of what you learned in Ireland, and you guys are in for treats. It involves a cross-dressing comedian, a country and Western singer, which I didn't know existed in Ireland, but apparently is quite a thing. Uh, my own ignorance there exposed, and, uh, and an elderly couple that captivated an entire nation, which is pretty cool. So we're gonna hear about that in a quick second. We'll get to uh, Lorena's question, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get back into the program. Uh, Lorena asks, Sometimes I can get caught up in using language that is too specific to our work and not broad enough for a general audience to engage them and catch their attention. Do you have any tips on working through that? So I think one of the challenges I think we all face, Craig, is sometimes we have our own little lexicon or jargon that we use mm. with organizations and we forget that not everybody speaks um, 
uh, whatever that organization's uh, you know, special language or the acronyms that we use, that sort of thing. How do you, how do you get out of that, that trap? Yeah, so like that's kind of something that I would actually kind of come up against often in my work is like, you know, you're, you're, you're working with people, um, they're like absolutely committed to whatever cause that they're campaigning on. Um, and they do, they have like, they're, 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 they're convinced and they know what they're campaigning on is completely right. And they have all the language that goes with that, um, that speaks to them. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, that often means that you can lose sight of actually trying to speak to people outside of, of that kind of, you know, cohort of people who are already convinced. So I think what we need to always be doing, so when we're thinking about anything to, to do with kind of, I think this is overall, just in terms of our, our communications, is thinking, okay, I, I always think about kind of like middle Ireland. So, you know, speaking to a 45-year-old woman in, in, in the middle of Ireland, you know, is she going to understand what we're, what we're talking about here? Um, so I think it's, it's having that kind of persona um, whatever that might be, and, and just constantly reminding yourself of that, um, because we can get caught up, but it's just important just to remind ourselves, okay, we're convinced, but we need to make sure that, that, that other people are, and so it's kind of just bringing the, the language back to, to those, you know? Um, yes, so and, and it's thinking that through, that, that goes back to my point about so whatever the aim, whatever the particular like aim or objective is, you know, figuring out what kind of content best speaks to that. And then that's when your language will also feed in. What, how do we best communicate this to that audience in order to meet this objective? Actually, you know what? I'm going to take the privilege one more because I think yeah. Catherine has a great question and, and you're especially well equipped to answer it, which is um, wondering whether you're seeing impacts from GDPR on digital strategy for policy change campaigns. And for those folks who maybe have missed this. This is a, a new set of rules that came actually from the European Union and it's being starting to roll out across the globe um, because we're all interconnected thanks to the internet uh, that require people to opt in so that there's greater privacies and protections. You can't spam people. But uh, Catherine's question is, does that, that effort uh, have an impact on some of the work that you're doing or some of the work that you're seeing out there? Yeah, um, I think the biggest impact that GDPR has had to date is on kind of like membership lists. So if, you know, people like organizations might have had long-standing membership lists, um, but not necessarily knowing like how long people have been um, active on those lists, you know, and that's kind of where GDPR came in. So if people hadn't hadn't signed up within the last two years, you had to go back to them and get them to then opt in like post GDPR. So a lot of organizations um, mailing lists were then like basically decimated. So I think a lot of people are now trying to rebuild those lists. Um, but I think it also has had a, like, you know, so that's difficult and um, has made it a little bit harder, but I think it, it has almost kind of, required organizations to actually re-engage with people a lot more and you know and and not to kind of rely on what was probably like a bit passive support whereas like now it's actually it was an opportunity to like really re-engage them again um, and then also to reach out to to newer audiences as well and then you know at the same time doing so in a way people are very aware and cognizant of GDPR here so when people are collecting information, they are doing so in a way that protects people's privacy. So it's letting them know. So you can't, you can't like, you know, um, tell people that they're signing up for X and then send them an email about Y. You know, that's, you can't kind of like cross post or with, with, with people's email addresses anymore. Um, and people are very aware of that. So I think at the end of the day, individual's privacy is much more protective protected um, and as campaigners and like organizations they're they're respectful of that as well you know and I suppose it's forcing them to come up with new and, and innovative ways to, to re-engage or reignite people's support um, in causes. Okay thank you so let's pause on Q&A we'll come back to it again at the end uh, but for now why don't you go ahead and take us through if you would uh, the amazing case study uh, yeah. from your work uh, in Ireland I know we're going to talk a little bit about Australia as well. Yeah, cool. 
Okay. Um, yes. So I'm just going to give um, a case study then, so taking into consideration what we've previously discussed and I suppose how we practically applied that here in Ireland during the marriage equality referendum in 2015. So yeah, on the 22nd of May in 2015, Ireland became the first country in the world to introduce uh, marriage equality by a vote of the people. And let me tell you, it was the most amazing day, um, and one that I will absolutely never, never forget. Um, but months before that, that amazing day in May, um, you know, when we set out to build this campaign, we very much were doing so with 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 digital in mind, um, and. When I'm talking this through, it, I will be kind of swaying back and forth between the overall campaign strategy and then how I suppose how we used digital as well. But basically what we were trying to do was to build a positive campaign and one that people wanted to be a part of. So for the, the months and like a lot of months in the lead up to, to the campaign or to the referendum, we conducted um, research to try and get a better sense of, you know, what was the support for marriage equality at that time? What type of messages were going to, to resonate with people? Uh, what type of messengers were going to, to resonate with, with audiences? You know, and that research um, demonstrated to us that at the time we had a 20% core support base. Um, they were going to vote yes, no, no argument was going to change their minds. And then on the flip side, we had a 20% no, no vote. And they were going to vote no, no, yes, argument was going to change their mind. So essentially what we done, we, we just kind of pushed that no vote to one side. We had a strict kind of policy from the outset that we weren't going to engage with those, with those audiences and those people or the, the or, or really the no campaigners as well um, because we just saw that as as wasted efforts energy and resources and um, what we wanted to do was really focus on that 60 percent in the middle so that was like the movable middle they th th that was the group of people that were going to decide the outcome of the referendum some were maybe soft yeses and soft noes but they were really going to be influenced by the type of campaign that was going to be run and i suppose it was our job to be able to bring the majority of those over to the yes side and we knew you know we knew from from, from our experience that that was going to require this 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 positive campaign if it was good, if like if, if we were going to end up in this kind of like divisive kind of environment where there was mud slinging back and forth between the opposing sides, we believe that that was just going to shut down any opportunity to engage that that cohort in the middle. They just wouldn't want to 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 be a part of that. You know, and a lot of these people, I suppose, had questions or concerns. You know, in theory, they might have been like, oh yeah, you know, I think I'm going to vote yes, but what about this or what about that? So we wanted to create a space where people felt comfortable that they could engage and ask those questions and address those concerns. So then, you know, hopefully we would bring them over to the yes side. So at the core, that was our real, real objective. Um, but then also not losing sight of that core 20% support base as well. They were super important because we really wanted to, to, to mobilize and motivate them to become agents of change and, and advocates of the yes vote as well. So they would go home to their family and their friends and talk about why they, they were voting yes um, on the 22nd of May. Um, and essentially through our digital platforms, we wanted to, to, to inspire all of that, that action um, online and convert that into, into offline support. So then, with that in mind, how did we go and, and build this campaign? Um, so I suppose this is part of the overall strategy as well, but like, you know, our, our campaign frame was very much um, anchored in the idea of becoming equals in the eyes of our constitution uh, for the first time. You know, this was an opportunity to treat all of our citizens equally for the first time. And we were coming up on the, the 100th anniversary of the Irish um, Republic. So that was that kind of whole constitutionality um, um, idea. So 
sitting under that campaign frame, then we had a set of values. We were very much kind of like appealing to people's values through this campaign. And you'll see that image there is, is from our, our first billboard and says, loving, fair, loving, equal, fair, generous, inclusive. There are many words to describe Ireland today. On the 22nd of May, we only need one. And again, you know, from that research that we had done, um, we, we knew that people, you know, Irish people are, are, are fair and decent. And, and what we were saying is like, that it's the fair and decent thing to do um, is, is to vote yes in this referendum. And um, we, I was, we were discussing this with Sean the other day, and we were talking about how it's very different from how this was approached through the efforts in the US. And there was very much kind of like framed in, 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 in love and equality. Um, and it's interesting, we just like, I think we knew instinctively ourselves that kind of, that the, the, the love message wasn't going to go down well here. Um, it's a people, I, people, I think it's just kind of seen as too, too fluffy. Um, and it just, yeah, it, 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 was, it, it wasn't something that kind of re resonated with them. Um, you know, uh, if from some of the focus groups, there was like, older gentlemen and that they'd be saying sure if they want to be as miserable as I am in my marriage let them go and do it so like that's me being um, a bit facetious but but in, essentially that's kind of what we were trying to tap into is kind of like you know let them be this is this is the fair and decent thing to do and that's why I'm I'm voting yes on the 22nd of May and um, so Underneath those values then, that like the tone was going to be really, really important. So that's what we're saying about building that, that, that positive campaign and maintaining that positive tone throughout as well. Like looking back now, and, and not just me, people do say this like, God, you know, how did you manage to kind of maintain that positive tone throughout? You know, people were really respectful, both online and offline. And, and, and as well, to, to, to the values point as well, people, when reflecting on the campaign, people do remember this, you know, that this positive campaign that was run and also that it became so much more than just about marriage. It became about the type of society and the type of uh, people that, that we saw ourselves you know, to be, you know, or what, what type of Ireland do we, do we want to live in? You know, and people do remember that. So I think that was a real um, achievement on behalf of, of, of the, the Yes campaign. And then the messaging, as I said, we tested a lot of different messages, what was going to work with people, and that was really important. Um, but I think equally, if not more important, is the messengers as well. So with, with that in mind, um, we, when we were starting to move into the actual campaign then, you know, it was all about, okay, so in order for us to win as a, as a minority, we needed to build a majority. And that required getting as many people on our side as possible, speaking to as many different cohorts of people as possible. So just bearing in mind, we were a small campaign team based out of our HQ in Dublin. There was probably about, like let's say maybe less than 20 paid staff, and then we probably had another maybe 20 volunteers um, in HQ. Now, there was a lot of people like around the country in different local groups, but in, in our headquarters in Dublin, it was a, a relatively small team. Um, and we knew that we weren't going to be able to do this alone, nor did we want to, um, uh, or not, nor were we going to be able to speak to all of the different cohorts um, and all the different target audiences that we knew we needed to, to speak to and appeal to. Um, so one of the things that, that we started out with at the, uh, um, at the outset was we started to use our contacts and you know, getting kind of like well-known and celeb people um, to get involved in the campaign. And it, it, we started with a register to vote campaign and we provided different people like, you know, with this, this sheet that basically said, I'm ready to vote. And it had the name and the brand, Yes Equality on that. And we were literally just like, can you share this on your Twitter, send out a tweet, send out a, a Facebook post. And when well-known people um, did that, it, like, it really kind of spread across the internet, but also was reported upon in the, in the national media. So when we went out as Yes Equality, like the name, you know, and this is where we're the campaigning group for the Yes Vote, um, that kind of activity really helped us to, to break outside of, of our bubble and our core support base in those first um, few weeks. 
So this is something now that we, we actually, we, you know, we noticed, okay, this is really working. This type of content is really resonating with people. And so we, so we try to do more and more of that. Um, and I suppose as the campaign was rolling on, more and more people were being asked their, their, their opinions, you know, how are you going to vote? Are you, like, are you for yes? And so whenever well-known people were, were asked and they, they endorse a yes vote, we would then kind of create the, these, these graphics for our social media. And it became some of our, our most shared content throughout the, the course of the whole campaign, actually. And so it was responding to those trends and, 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 and making it more sophisticated and developing it throughout the campaign. So just, yeah, here are a couple of examples as Shaw mentioned. This on the left here is um, Daniel O'Donnell. So um, I don't know, anyone will be aware of Daniel O'Donnell, but he is like this uber famous <laughs> like country and Western singer um, from Ireland. He's been around for donkey's years, um, but is loved and adored by like middle-aged women around the country. Um, I, re I remember when this happened, you know, so Daniel was being interviewed um, on Irish radio and one of my colleagues in the office, she was listening in in case he was going to be asked the question. And sure enough, he was asked and he, he endorsed the yes vote and it was literally like, drop all tools, Daniel O'Donnell has said he's voting yes. And we were like scrambling and, you know, but we quickly kind of like put this, this graphic together and shared it out. And we mentioned virality earlier, but this really did go like viral, you know, yeah. because it was kind of like that unexpected voice. Um, but it's so powerful as well, because that's going to speak to so many different people that I nor you know, many others in the campaign wouldn't have been able to speak to. Um, yes, the, on the right then, that's just an example of, you know, we were trying to bring a little bit of humour into the campaign as well. So this is um, Mrs. Brown, the alter ego of an Irish comedian called Brendan O'Carroll, um, has this very successful TV sitcom show called Mrs. Brown's Boys, um, which is, I think, it's, it's also been shown on the BBC in the UK and in Australia. Um, and it's been voted like sitcom of the century or something like that um, it's kind of beyond me but again you know reaches a whole new audience and actually Mrs. Brown made this really powerful and um, humorous but also serious video for the campaign as well and it was actually it was really really a, a brilliant moment for for the campaign um, but I think it's also important, William, whilst we do have these well-known celebrity voices, it's not all, all about them either. You know, we needed to also have community leaders, people from all walks of life across the, in towns and villages across Ireland, speaking to people like them as well. And I have a couple of really lovely examples here. So there's, there's one video that I want to show. So hopefully this will work. So this is Bridget and Paddy. Um, so they made a video as part of this uh, Vote With Us campaign. So they were encouraging people to record videos and tell their stories about why they were voting yes. So this is one from a couple um, who are married for 50 years and living in uh, Loud, which is just north of Dublin. So hopefully this will work. Hello, I'm Bridge. And I'm Paddy. We are voting for equal marriage. We hope you will vote with us. We're from Dundalk. We're Roman Catholics and we will be 50 years married this year. We wish other couples, gay or straight, could legally avail of civil marriage and have the opportunity to experience the love, protections and companionship that we have experienced. 20 years ago, I probably would have voted no. But now that I know gay people and see the love and joy they can bring to life, and I will be voting yes. We worked hard for civil rights in Northern Ireland in the 60s. Now it is time to support civil rights in the South. We're grandparents and would wish that all our grandchildren are protected and treated as equals in the playground and in the eyes of the law. I'd ask you to take time to consider and reflect on something. It could happen sometime in the future that your son or daughter, grandchild or great-grandchild will tell you they are gay. 
But when they ask you how you voted in this referendum, or whether you bothered to vote at all, what will you tell them? Will you tell them you tried to make a difference? We have the opportunity to change things for the better. I know the ever-loving God that we believe in will say we did the right thing on the Christian thing and voting yes for marriage equality. We ask you to vote with us. Well, you got me tearing up. Yeah. <laughs> so you see that little uh, like nudge that Bridge gives Patty at the end? I think it's just so, so lovely. Um, you know, and Bridget and Paddy, like it, it really did, when I say it really kind of captured the imagination of the nation, like it really did. Um, a week after this, like the, the video went viral, um, and a week later, Bridget and Paddy were invited by Amnesty International to address um, a rally of like thousands of people in Dublin, and they spoke on stage and after the campaign, they received like a, an award for their contribution to the campaign. And, you know, they became stars in, in their own right, undeservedly so. And they were, they were loving every minute of it. Um, but, it was, but, it, but in all seriousness, it actually was really, really, really brilliant content. And uh, was, like, I can't explain the impact that, that this type of stuff had on the campaign. You know, so you heard Breed there talking you know, this is this is a Christian thing to do, and they were comparing it to the to the struggle for for civil rights in the North. They were literally hitting on so many like key messages that was going to resonate with other couples like them and people of faith like them, and um, all around the country. And that's just kind of one in a series of videos that we had from um, different people with different experiences, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, um, and. The, yes, just the impact it had was 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 profound. Um, again, something similar, um, but again, this is something that many people remember from the campaign was this um, "Ring Your Granny" um, video. So this was started by a group of students in Trinity College in Dublin. So they recorded a video of them each individually ringing their grandparents and asking them how they were going to vote in the referendum. You know, because I think a lot of people just assumed that older people were more conservative and they weren't necessarily going to, to vote yes for this. But what this video showcases is like that we, can, we shouldn't just assume that. So all of, all of the responses from the grandparents were like, of course I'm voting yes, you know, I'm sure I love you. Like, and you know, this is about, this is about you and future generations and yes, this is the right thing to do, you know, and this is the type of society that we need to be. Really, really like powerful stuff. And I think where the, the, the real impact of, of the, the Ring Your Granny um, campaign was that it inspired other people to not only say like, you know, inspired a lot of people to, to ring their own grandparents and ask them how they were going to vote, because that was a difficult thing, thinking, oh gosh, you know, how are my grandparents going to react to this? So it's breaking down those barriers and inspiring people to make those kind of phone calls, have those conversations. And then in some cases, you know, it's inspired other people to create their own videos and share them online as well, of them ringing their grandparents. So it's a really, really, really lovely moment and content for the campaign. This is actually something that we took and adapted in Australia as well. And um, so, yeah, so instead of ring your granny, we had a... Um, Ring your rellos, which is slang for relatives. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it was it was great. I think we made like I think we made like three or four different videos. Um, different people ringing their relatives. Again, you know, it, it they just kind of spread across the internet and it's become really really good, powerful content that hits all of like the key messages as well. And just a, a quick clarifying question. Yeah. So so these obviously were fairly unproduced videos, Bridget and Patty, someone filmed them, but I'm guessing that was not a camera crew uh, you know, in with a you know, full production team and a big truck or something out in the yard. Um, but that seems to be where we're trending. More and more people feel like I need to spend a lot of money. I need to hire you know, some famous director and make something extraordinary or spend thousands upon thousands of dollars. But that, that doesn't appear what seems to be the case here. Um, yeah, and I would actually say, I would totally agree, you don't need to be moving towards those kind of like 
highly produced, high end um, videos. Like it, it depends on on on, on 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 what the you know what the objective is, but. I, be, I, I believe, and I've kind of experienced it, this kind of real, authentic, user-generated content can go much, much further. Um, I'll actually give an example from the, the Australian campaign. So, so like that, we did, you know, we put a lot of, of, of resources in. Like there was, a, there was a whole separate team called Story Lab where they, 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 they spent ages kind of profiling, finding different people and going out and making this really lovely, lovely, well-produced videos. And that worked really, really well. But when we would actually kind of like harvest social media and kind of like find videos of people that they recorded themselves. Like there was this um, guy and I think his name was Bill. He was in his sixties and th his daughter recorded a video of him sitting on his porch, drinking a bottle of VB, like Australian beer. And he was talking about like how, you know, he's a true blue, true blue Australian guy drinking his VB and he drives a hold in and he's definitely voting yes. Cause like it's the right thing to do. And we actually like that was, it was just kind of like this rough and ready video it's something that kind of like we, we spotted on, on social media. I, I made contact with, with the daughter and I was like, can we take this video and share it on our own channels? And she was like, yes, of course. And that flew, you know, so that, that cost us nothing. And it, is, it was more authentic, it was more real. Um, and pe people, audiences just love that kind of uh, real authentic content. So yeah, you can, you can go to all of these efforts to, to kind of create this high-end, good quality content. Um, but I think you also still need that, that real, um, authentic stuff that people produce themselves, that user-generated content. And you said something that's probably worth just remarking on. You went and asked permission, and you, and you found something that, that someone had made that resonated. You didn't just grab it and share it. You took an extra step. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it is, I think it is important. You know, we, I think we were lucky in that you know, most people, they do like, you know, they're happy for, for their, their, their content to be shared. But when you're in that type of like campaign environment, I suppose the last thing that you want to do is, 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 is attract any kind of like undue negative attention. And um, that can come with not seeking permission and then just, yeah, share, sharing without somebody's permission. They're saying, well, hang on now. I didn't, I didn't give you permission to use that, you know? Um, so I do. I think it's important to to actively reach out. I'm on the whole, m like the majority of people are happy for you to use their stuff. But I think it's it's worth. And also, like the opportunities that can come with that. So this also that's a good example of where the teams worked really well together. So when I spotted that video and we used it like on our social media channels, I then was like, okay, well this is flying, you know. So then I actually got the comms team to get in contact with the daughter and see if they could like work with the dad to do some local media. And then he was, so he was actually, he was profiled in, in, in local uh, press as well as a result of that. So it's kind of connecting the dots and making them kind of like full, full circle, you know? Great. Um, okay. So yeah, just moving on from, from that. Um, so one of the points earlier I was talking about was having that kind of real relevant, informative and, and shareable content, you know, that's going to get across your, your key message. And this is, um, I, I think, you know, one of the questions we were asked earlier about is, 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 is resources, but being able to kind of um, speak to kind of different cohorts as well. So I think one of the things that, that we should... Tr that I certainly try and get into the habit of doing is asking myself, okay, you know, is this something that I would share? You know, is this kind of meeting a certain aim or objective? And if so, you know, what, what is that? And so a, a couple of examples from the Yes Equality campaign here. So one of the things that we needed to do um, was to get as many people on, many young people onto the register as possible. Because we knew that the highest support was amongst those younger audiences, but a, they were, you know, probably weren't old enough to, to vote before this. Uh, so they're first time voters or they just don't, they just weren't on the register because they just don't generally go and vote or, you know, so, so the research would say. Everywhere, huh? Yeah. Um, although I think we booked the trend definitely with this one. Um, 
But so like, you know, that was a real key campaign objective was to get as many people added to the register as possible. And, you know, it's not the easiest of, of processes. And um, when we get into kind of like the supplementary register, like you need a signature from like a police officer, things like that. So it's, yeah, it's not the easiest process, but what we did, we created this kind of like infographic, which is like, it's actually as easy as one, two, three, when in fact there's probably about seven steps in that. But like, it's trying to get that message across to people like, you know, this is important, go and do this. So it is, it's relevant, it's informative, it's letting people know how they can get onto the register and it's also shareable. So like if I saw this, I might be on the register myself, but there might be many people in my network who are not on the register. So I'm gonna share this, you know, for them. And um, so I think it ticks all of those boxes. So when you're when having that in mind when you're creating content, does it tick these boxes? Is it going to is it going to to, to achieve what, what we envisage it to achieve? Um, similarly, when we're talking about those younger audiences, I suppose that one of the issues that we had or the concerns that we had was around complacency amongst younger voters as well. Um, because they're like fully supportive, they were like, ah oh, sure, that's gonna fly through, you know. And we were saying, God, you know, well, it's not really going to fly through. And especially if all of you young people stay at home. So we need every single person to get out there and vote. Yes. So it's trying to create that sense of urgency, you know. And um, so this is an example of kind of th that's those graphics that we created to, to create that sense of urgency um, amongst people as well. Um, and I remember actually um, on the day of the vote itself. So we also knew that if there was going to be a high turnout, that would be in our favor. Or if it was a low turnout, that wouldn't be in our favor. So in advance of voting day, we created these campaign alerts that we were going to put out based on feedback that we were hearing on, on turnout. So if it was, if we were hearing good things about um, turnout, we'd put out the green alert. If we were hearing mixed reports we put out the amber alerts or if we were hearing it was a low turnout we were going to put out the, the red alert um, and we were actually hearing good things about turnout but we still put out the red alert and we were like turnout's low we <laughs> ring, if you voted great but you need to ring all your friends and families and go tell them to vote and literally people were like oh my god oh my god like you know shared here shared there shared everywhere um you know <laughs> Probably a little bit uh, sneaky, but definitely served a purpose. <laughs> well, you won, right? <laughs> and and is that so? So turnout was really important here. It's obviously always important in the United States as well. And I suspect in almost every democracy, right? But but we didn't see that in in the United States here in 2016, or or with the Brexit vote in the UK. Um, uh, in oh goodness, was this 2017? No, 20 in 2016. Well, earlier 2016. Yeah. What do you think, uh, was the paid uh, social just deafening to the point where it discouraged some of this kind of grassroots organizing? Or what, what do you, was there some delta, some distinction there? Yeah, so like I think that that's one of the aspects, um, you know, was part of that kind of like ever changing landscape is that, you know, these kind of paid advertising are also being used for voter suppression as well. Um, and that's, that's a real, that's a real issue. Um, and I think in the UK with, with Brexit and probably with, with, with uh, the Trump campaign as well, you know, people were just so kind of um, like disenfranchised and uh, just disillusioned by it all. So, you know, when I talk about the importance of kind of creating that positive campaign or that, that, that space that people want to be a part of, I think like, you know, from early out in, in, in Brexit, like that, that space was just kind of shut off. So people were just like, oh, I can't even engage with this, you know? Um, and I think that's a real issue. Whereas, you know, we actually experienced the opposite. The closer it was getting to the day, the more the momentum was building. And it really kind of felt like a sense of, oh my God, you know, this something big is happening here. And it became like this, moment that everyone wanted to be a part of and that's why the get out the vote was so big it's because people didn't want to miss out on this you know it was almost like that kind of FOMO element. Uh, FOMO um, sorry I, I Tristan okay. who's over here is laughing because it's like IRL I just learned is in real life but FOMO means fear of missing out. Fear of missing out okay yeah that, that will hopefully stick in my brain. Yeah, so people didn't want their opportunity to miss the opportunity of, of voting in this. Um, 
Are we okay? Will we move on? Yeah, yeah let's, let's move on. And we have a few questions and we run a little bit over time. I think that's okay. People seem to be tolerating this because I think we're having this, for my part, this is fascinating and good stuff. So please. Cool. Okay, I'll try to quickly go through the, the last few slides anyway. Um, if you can manage to do this, I think using kind of digital and social media to turn negative situations into positives can be a real campaign, um, a real benefit for campaigns, especially, you know, those who are campaigning for, for progressive social change. So again, I'll just give the example from Yes Equality. So using posters on lampposts during kind of political campaigns here is, is a, a main kind of campaigning um, staple. Um, and the no posters started going up on lampposts around the country about two weeks before the yes posters. And they were particularly nasty and people got very kind of worked up and frustrated by what the, what they were saying and and also the absence of the yes posters to counter to counter those and um, so we 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 were noticing all of this kind of like frustrating frustration and we we're like okay well let's kind of channel this into a way that's going to to, to benefit us so we use this as an opportunity we said to people like look we don't have posters up on lampposts because we don't have money for for posters so we set up a crowdfunding campaign and we were like you know um help us to to be able to put your donation we'll put posters up around the country and um, and we saw a huge spike in donations to the campaign over the first that, that first 24 hours after the no posters went up so we were putting out messages like don't get angry don't get frustrated donate to the campaign and we did, you know, we did see the kind of the return for that then after that. Um, and similarly, like when the issue was being debated on the media, so on television or on radio, that people tended to get a little bit kind of like angry and frustrated at that time as well. And we'd also, you know, we'd be putting out messages saying, don't get angry, don't get frustrated, join your local canvassing group or volunteer for the campaign, providing those avenues for people that they can say, okay, you know, I'll use, I'll use this frustration and channel it in a way that's most effective and that will help the campaign. So if you can try to identify those opportunities and capitalize on those moments, and um, yeah, I think it can be a really, really powerful way of, of utilizing those, those platforms. Um, then also, I think, you know, and many people will also kind of be familiar with this, but using these platforms, yes, we're primarily talking about communications here, but also being able to use it for, for mobilizing and organizing as well. You know, when we set out at the start of this campaign, we wanted to have like a local Yes Equality group um, in every county across, the, uh, across Ireland. So that would have been 26 um, Yes Equality groups. When in fact, we, over the course of the campaign, we grew to a network of over 60 groups. And wow. um, so in like you know, small towns and villages all across all across the country. Um, there was even a few up in Connemara, where you know, <laughs> they're from. Um, you know, and in many cases, these groups, like, you know, they, they, they started as Facebook groups and people were joining and then they called a meeting. And then many of them, they kept really like active um, presence on social media throughout the campaign. So they're using Facebook to promote fundraising efforts or, you know, they were creating WhatsApp groups to let people know when and where they were going canvassing. And so, yeah, there's, there's an example of a tweet from Yes Equality in Cork. So, you know, they tweeted out um, that's uh, the schedule of canvassing for that week. So it's just making it very easy for people to, to, to join and get involved. Um, you know, and that's just an example of all of the people then turning up and going out of the canvas. So, yeah. So, how do you actually, you know, take that online action and, and translate it into the offline? Um, because, you know, we knew at the end of the day, we, this was going to be won by people knocking on doors and talking to people. And so we were using the online platforms to really drive that, that offline action. Um, yeah, so I think one of, the, one of the other kind of, I suppose, emerging trends um, is a lot of research has been done kind of on volunteer giving. You know, I think people are less inclined these days, you know, to go out kind of like carrying donation buckets, but they want to utilize their skills in the most effective way for different campaigns and causes. You know, so we kind of saw this as an opportunity to put a call out and get people who are creative um, to come up with some graphics that we could use on, on our digital platforms. So we use, we actually kind of um, 
use this tactic during the get out the vote campaign. So again, research have been done which suggested that if you plan when you're going to vote, you're more likely to go and do so. So we put a call out asking for people, you know, obviously in line with their overall kind of brand identity using our name to kind of create some graphics for us. And it was a way of, you know, it was a win for us because we had content that we could then share out, but it was also, I suppose, giving back in a way um, and bringing, bringing those kind of people into the fold and making them feel like that they had a contribution to the campaign. So it's a win-win. They're getting to utilize their skills. They feel like that they're contributing to the campaign. And then also, you can also, you, can, you have ownership and you're able to put that content out on your digital platforms as well. So again, trying to, oper- op- to recognize those opportunities do you, like do you have people within your supporter network who are graphic designers or can help you build like a microsite or you know who's skilled in a piece you have a long piece of video and you want to edit it down where can you can you utilize those skills especially if you're kind of campaigning on a on a shoestring budget like we were well, this is amazing so these two things that we're seeing down here were actually made by someone not on the payroll not working at HQ and double yeah 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 so just from within our our, our supporter network that's amazing Um, yeah, so I'll just kind of finish up talking about the, the Irish Marriage Equality um, referendum campaign. Um, and I'll let you uh, know about Home to Vote. So I'm not sure if, if anyone would have heard about this, but this is probably the one thing that people remember most um, from the campaign. Um, so, you know, Irish people, we like to go all over the world. And there's <laughs> literally Irish people um, at every corner of the globe. Um, and because of the type of campaign that, that, we, that, that was run, you know, it was this really kind of positive campaign and there was that kind of FOMO element and there was this real opportunity for the country. What we started to see was so many people from countries all across the world were coming back home to vote. So this, I would love to be able to, to, to claim credit for starting this, but like, you know, it's, it actually, it started organically, but like about 72 hours uh, before the vote, people who were coming home started to share their stories um, online. So of them getting on the plane from Sydney or getting the boat from the UK or um, trains, planes, automobiles, you name it. However people were traveling home, they were sharing these stories on their social media. And it was just, it was phenomenal. I think it was so, it was such a, it was so emotional um, because that's when it really clicked with people. Oh my goodness, you know, this is, this is so much bigger than, than just, than, we're not just voting on marriage here. Like, you know, this is the type of country that, that people want to travel from all corners of the world to come home and, and have the opportunity to vote for the type of country that they want to live in. Um, and people just remember it so warmly and so fondly. And I think it really captured and encapsulated the type of campaign that we wanted, that we wanted to run. And just like a couple of stats there. So, yeah, there was 117,000 different tweets. Like, that's huge for an Irish um, campaign. Uh, 117,000 tweets that generated 416 million impressions. That's just from home to vote tweets alone in the last 74 hours. And I've been reliably informed that that's kind of like equivalent to a World Cup final. Um, though I'll take that as a win. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's incredible. Congratulations. That is so yeah, incredible. like it, that's really lovely. So I'd encourage you all just to, to go on and even just type in hashtag home to vote in Google that's or on Twitter it, right? and have a, look at, have a look at some more. That's actually a really an interesting idea. I'm sorry, I don't mean to, to cut you short or, or throw off your flow here, but, but are there some, some hashtags that you look to as sort of instructive ways to kind of, you know, go back and kind of deconstruct campaigns that worked. So home to vote, you could presumably still archived on Twitter and you can see those tweets. Are there others that you look to as sort of, these are exemplars, places where you can see what these organic or in some cases very intentional and well-planned out campaigns are? Are there some? Um, well, from, 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 the, from the Irish referendum campaign, the, the, the main one that we used was uh, hashtag marref. So it's kind of like short for marriage referendum. Um, and that was, yeah, that was the main kind of like campaign hashtag. Um, and it was supposed to be kind of like a neutral one. Um, 
So it wasn't like we didn't come up with that or anything, but that's kind of one that was being used most generally just to discuss. So we would use that then. You know, we had our own one, obviously, like hashtag yes equality and vote yes. Um, but I think if you want kind of the, the most comprehensive view of the discussion around the referendum, it was hashtag MarRef. Okay. That was used. Thank you. No worries. I would definitely do go on and check out Home to Vote a little bit more as well. Yeah, it sounds incredible. Um, so yeah, two years later then, um, I was lucky enough to be able to go down to Australia um, as part of their campaign for marriage equality. So it was an interesting one. Um, so like, you know, this had been an issue that was being debated for, for many years, as likewise in, in Ireland. But, you know, there was this kind of, I suppose, unsh- and like people were unsure as to how this was going to go. Was it going to be done by legislation like it had been done in so many other countries? Um, like we're part of parliament going to, 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 to sort this out. And then it was looking like it was actually going to be a referendum. But then it was back to, okay, no, it's actually going to be the parliament that are going to, then it was actually back to, to being a referendum um, or a plebiscite. But in fact, it ended up being a postal survey. So the, the government at the time, they put forward this bill to like have a referendum, but the opposition Labour Party, they voted that down. So in a way of going around it, the government actually um, held a national postal survey. So it wasn't, say, so it wasn't carried out by the Electoral Commission, it was actually carried out by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So um, essentially, for all the world, it was like a national um, poll, you know, to, to gauge people's like uh, views on the issue. Um, so it was non-binding, but so what it was seen as, it was going to be an instruction to the parliament. So if the majority of people voted yes, that was an instruction to the parliament to introduce legislation. Um, and the, so, that was, so this was kind of a first that, we, that, um, that a postal survey was happening on such a kind of a, an important issue. And then to add another layer of complexity or another challenge was the fact that, so elections and referendums are compulsory vote, so this compulsory voting um, in Australia. But because this was a postal survey that was being conducted by the Bureau of Statistics, it wasn't compulsory. And um, so it kind of it added that n- another hurdle for the campaigners to get over in order to be able to, okay, so not only do we have to convince people, but now we have to do a get out the vote campaign, which is something that they're not used to doing over there because people have to turn out and vote or else they're fined. Um, so I think that was kind of part of the reason why I was kind of brought over as well is because, you know, our efforts at campaigning and bringing the, the, the vote out as well so successfully in 2015. I can do my own horn and say that. Um, you did it. But so whilst so when we were talking about kind of the, the, the changing landscape earlier, but then also, but the principles are the same. I think this is actually a really good example of that. So yeah, you know, I think the difference between 2015 and Ireland and 2017 was, you know, we were definitely more, we had to use like digital advertising a lot more and the landscape was totally different. That organic reach had plummeted and was much more difficult to reach and and mobilize and persuade audiences um, on social media. But I think that the the principles very much remained the same. You know, we had to build a positive campaign that again, that people wanted to be part of. One of the the, the key things, I think that kind of comes, comes through from all the content I showed there that what we done in, in Ireland, we, we were just constantly telling people stories, you know, so like the Bridge and Paddy, uh, mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters. And again, you know, we were, we, we, it was a tried and tested model. So we've done that again in, in, in Australia. And um, a lot more of this kind of like measuring and adapting. So what's working, looking like really heavily relying on, on analytics, doing a lot of A-B testing. What messages are working? What do we what like? What do we need to do more of? Um, so it was like we had like different images that were going to different audiences, and they were okay. That's having that's having a bigger reach there. Let's put our our resources behind that one. Um, so a lot more of that, and this has to be done quickly on the on the fly, you know, and uh, and uh, yeah, and you're being kind of really strategic and quick about that. 
Um, inviting people into the campaign, I think, is, is really important as well. So that's like the, the example I gave of, I think it was at Bill, the guy, the true blue Aussie bloke. You know, so we were very much kind of inviting him in. Uh, it's benefiting us. We got to use kind of like his story, uh, but also, you know, again, putting him out into, into the local media. Um, and the way with so many different examples of that, I'm um, just so providing a platform for people to, to get involved. Um, a lot with, you know, there's a lot more people kind of creating video content and things like that. So again, giving them a platform, oh, again, with their permission, um, you know, so they might have the same reach that we would have had, for example. So saying, you know, can we take your content and push it out, obviously, you know, with full credit. And um, so again, win-win for, for us and for them. And then this was key. So we needed to really ensure momentum because this vote took place over um, about two months. So the postal survey was open for two months. So what we, what we really wanted to do was at the, at the start, get as many people in the first week, two weeks to return their postal surveys. And um, so that they had to put them back in the post. Um, so we wanted as many people to do that in the first couple of weeks as possible. Um, but we also needed to try and, that this was the difficult bit, trying to keep that momentum um, throughout. You know, so anyone who hadn't returned their, their postal survey, they, we were still hitting them and reminding them that they had to go and do so. Um, so one of the ways that we, we, we did that was through this, uh, it was kind of like a post your yes campaign. So at different stages, you know, we were profiling different families from all, all areas across the continent um, of them going, making trips to their post box. You know, so we were trying to gather as many of these stories and just put them out at, at different times and um, throughout that long process. And again, it was trying to build this sense of momentum and movement that like, you know, geez, look at all of these people, something big is happening here. Um, and I'm trying, yeah, so again, trying to tap into that FOMO, that social pressure. It's like, oh my God, like, look, we've got thousands and thousands of straight are flocking to their post boxes. You need to get in on this and go do it yourself. Um, so yeah, I think that was, that was, one of the ways that, that we really um, were able to, 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 to ensure that momentum throughout the campaign, keep people as involved as possible, um, and to really ensure that, that kind of turnout. And the turnout was actually super high. They, like, I think the turnout in Ireland was something like 65% or something, um, but in Australia it was like in the late 80s. Oh, wow. the, the turnout was so high. Um, and I think it's because they're used to voting and they were, even though this was a postal survey, it was they were really treating it like a vote. And um, so I think that's why we saw such a high turnout. And the, so the turnout was higher, but what was really interesting was the closeness in the results. So in Ireland, the result was 60, 60, oh my God, I'm actually forgetting it. 62.3% yes. And in Australia, it was 61.8. So there was 0.5 of a difference actually in the outcome in terms of support. But they, Australia beat us hands down in terms of, 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 of turnout. Wow. And um, so, yeah, look, I just, I suppose with the, the Australian example, I wanted to get across that fact that, yes, the, the landscape had changed the way that we use digital platform um, was totally different, but it was up to us to be able to respond and adapt and keep reminding ourselves of those key principles and those key tactics and just finding ways um, to, to really amplify them throughout. And yeah, so with that, we will move on to the, the, the second part of the q and I'll just leave that up. So if anybody wants to find out more information about anything that we've discussed th this evening. Not, I'm not just plugging my own website, but um, on forachange.org. So you'll, you'll find m uh, pretty much all of what we've discussed, more information on that. There's actually a really in-depth case study of Yes Equality on that site as well. And um, so if people want to find out a little bit more, they can go on and do so there. Excellent. All right, well, we have a few questions, if that's all right. And we'll take a yeah. of your time. Uh, Stephanie asks, you talk about messaging research and focus groups, which helped form the core messages that you use in your campaign. 
Uh, can you talk a little bit more about this? Uh, what level of capacity and resources were needed? Um, and did you need to take an active role in this? How long did it take? Was there a plan to put these messages into action before this began? Um, I think for a lot of us, we understand that this is something folks in, on, at least here in the US, Madison Avenue wants tons of research and testing before they sell us toothpaste or soap, or cars, whatever it might be. But it's a relatively new practice in, in the foundation and nonprofit world here. So okay. you, and, and frankly, a lot of us don't have resources to do these sorts of things. But, but the Yes campaign in Ireland, at the very least, sounds like 20 people, full-time, paid staff, and then a number of folks offline or, or off staff, volunteer basis. But, but I presume resources were fairly scarce, and yet you still were able to do some of that research and testing. Yeah, so oh, we, uh, yes. It was, we knew that this was going to be super, super important. So I think we, we started the kind of, this was new to us as well. So probably worth kind of saying that at the outset as well. Um, yes, Equality was made up of three different, uh, say, NGOs or advocacy organizations. So there was Glenn, the Gay and Lesbian Equality Network, Marriage Equality, and the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. So those three organizations came together to form um, Yes, Equality. And any, all of the people involved, those different organizations, hadn't really campaigned on this scale before, where, you know, essentially where we had to convince the majority of the electorate. Before that, it was very much kind of like advocacy and lobbying members of our parliament. So this was kind of a whole new experience um, for, for us as well. Um, but we knew that we needed to put that kind of proper resources behind the research at the outset. So I would say we started that process in probably January 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we, 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 so we enlisted the services of people who, mm, this, was their, this was their bread and butter. You know? So it was expensive um, in terms of conducting this research because we did qualitative and quantitative um, research as well. So you know, we were trying to gauge general, like overall statistically representative um, public attitudes, but then also drill that down into a bit further and have those focus groups and test messages um, with the different people. So I suppose it, it, it was expensive, um, but we knew that it needed to be done if we were going to, to be effective with the rest of our resources. Makes sense. Uh, Muhammad asks, can you percentageize how digital content and communication should be prioritized and distributed for nonprofits? We all tend to have multiple goals, uh, telling the story of our organization and brand, soliciting and cultivating donors, nurturing and storing our current donors. Um, how do we prioritize these different goals and weave them into an overall strategy? Okay. Um, um, that's an interesting one because I, so I, like, I think I'd be reluctant to actually like put a percentage, say, on it in terms of like you should put X percent of resources behind your digital. Um, but what I would say is that I think it should be taken from, say, so, so often like social media or digital can kind of like float around the periphery of, of, of what you're doing. Um, so I think it's important to, to take it into the center of, of your planning because if you, if you bring it into this part of your planning, I think it can take out a lot of the resourcing that it's kind of people think that this requires. You know, oh, that's like, if we think about digital, like that's like another additional thing that we have to do. But bring it into your planning. So, you know, whatever, whatever that might be, thinking at that stage, so say you have, a new report that you're going to be launching or an event that you're going to be hosting. So when you're planning that, just thinking at that stage, okay, so what's this going to look like online or what do we need to do in order to really amplify and maximize this online? And I think that actually takes a, a, a lot of the kind of the, the, the resourcing, but also the daunting, oh, like we need to do something now with that after this. It takes that out of it as well when you actually kind of address it at that core kind of planning stage. Um, and also, it's, it's, it's probably a balancing act as well. So, you know, thinking about what's, what is the immediate kind of priority or objectives and where does digital sit in that? Is it really important? You know, well, then we dial it up. But is kind of more traditional comms, is that actually more important for this objective? Well, then we we'll focus on that. So that's why I'm kind of reluctant to put actually a percentage on it. It's, but it's, 
it's noticing kind of the importance and then applying it accordingly. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Let's do one more question just to be respectful of your time. Uh, and then I, if you don't mind, what perhaps we could do for people who did not get their question answered. Uh, that's the great thing about, this is a conversation about how to use digital tools and social media. So perhaps you could tweet your question and Craig, I presume you'd be okay giving them an answer sometime in the next few days. Yeah, no problem. Um, the, the Twitter handle's right down there, at for a change underscore org. And if you ask your question there, uh, I'm gonna make a promise on Craig's behalf, you'll, you'll get a response fairly soon. Um, Tristan is pointing me to a couple here. Which one do you want to do? Do you want to do this one or? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, I think we just kind of went, let's do Jessica's question. So, it, and thank you for voting for these. It really helps us guys. Uh, Jessica asked, it seems like the most viral content, it seems like most viral content is negative or exploits and sensationalized people's struggles. Our organization is striving to use a positive tone, but sometimes it's difficult to build interest that way. Any advice on staying positive and inspiring and generating good engagement? So this is sort of like uh, the old rule in local news here in the United States. You may have heard, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. Bad news travels faster than good news. How do, how do you maintain a positive tone when, when there's so much negativity out there? Um, I am of the opinion that that type of, say, that type of messaging or that type of content serves to only kind of speak to your base. So people who are already on board and who you're already speaking to. Um, I think you need to stay, if, if, you're, if you're going to move beyond that, I think you need to stay positive. Um, you know, and it needs to be inspiring and kind of showing, sh like showing people what the problem is, um, but compelling them in, a, like, you know, in such a way that they want to, to get involved. Um, and I like, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if I fully agree with there's only kind of like the negative stuff that tends to kind of like go viral. So like, you know, the examples there of, of Bridget and Patty or, you know, the Mrs. Brown, um, they didn't kind of focus on, on the, the negative. It was, it was the more positive. I mean, you know, there, there could have been, there could have been many examples that we, we, we could have used um, to show the injustices that the LGBT community had experienced over a number of years in Ireland. You know, we very much could have, could have, could have played that, that game. Um, but that wasn't, it wasn't going to be as, in, as inspiring and it wasn't going to create that space. So it's trying to kind of, yeah, flip it and, and provide other ways of getting outside of, of that kind of core, core support base that you have. And I think that requires the positive messaging. Yeah, and just to, to echo that, uh, there is a ton of research behavioral science out there that says that we as humans respond much more positively, uh, even in, in particularly when you're reading about news. If a news story is diagnosing a problem, you may read it, but you generally tend to walk away from it. There's something like, mm. you know, this, this is too big a problem. I can't do anything about it. When those same stories are written and there is an opportunity to take action, or even if it profiles somebody who's doing something to take on sometimes seemingly insurmountable problems, if there's an individual who's working towards a solution, that tends to inspire other people to get involved. So mm. I, I think that's probably what we saw a little bit in Ireland and in the United States and in Australia is that people do tend to respond to positive messages. It may not feel that way, among the intense folks who are deeply engaged, but for folks who, you know, this is not their, their uh, daily obsession, the, the chance to get them engaged is really about offering them a place to be a positive presence or to do something constructive. And I think most people tend to respond to that. Yeah, I completely agree. Ever the optimist. Yeah, it has to be. I just think that's, that's the trajectory we're on. Uh, I, should, uh, I should wrap up because I think we're losing this room in a second, but I want to say thank you very, very much, Craig. I know you stayed after hours to join us. Uh, I hope you all, uh, if you don't mind, on behalf of all my colleagues, a couple hundred people with us today, hope you know how deeply grateful we are. And, uh, and if I don't embarrass you to tell you that you're just a tremendous uh, role model and a real hero. So really grateful that you've been kind enough to share what you learned along the way. And hopefully we'll be able to get you to join us in Austin uh, this fall when we get together for ComNet 19. That's in October. For those of you who haven't signed up yet, please do. Believe it or not, tickets are gone. Went a lot faster through the early bird than we thought. And yes, there's a nice person back there who's telling me I got to go. So this will be recorded up online and we will see you all again very soon. Tristan, when's our next one? Like two and a half weeks, and uh, is this the Hispanic media ones? We're going to be talking about how to talk to the Latino community in the United States, how to communicate with them, and how critical that is with some folks from the Hispanic Communications Network, which is a media company here. So we'll be back about that uh, very, very soon. Craig, thank you very much, sir. Look forward to seeing you. 
uh, over a harp for too long. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Cheers. Goodbye. Bye.